This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. And I'm Nermeen Sheikh. Welcome to our listeners and viewers around the country and around the world. Confirmation hearings begin today from Mike Pompeo, the CIA director tapped by President Trump to become the next Secretary of State. Last year, the Senate confirmed Pompeo to head the CIA by a vote of 66 to 32, but the vote is expected to be far closer this year. At least one Republican, Rand Paul, has already announced he will vote against Pompeo due to his support for the Iraq invasion and for torture. And more Democrats are expected to oppose him this round. Democratic Senator Brian Schatz of Hawaii said on Twitter, quote, I voted yes on Pompeo for CIA on the theory that he would be the adult in the room. I was wrong. I'm voting no on Pompeo for Secretary of State because our top diplomat should believe in diplomacy. He has an alarming tendency towards military provocation and brinkmanship. Pompeo is a former congressman from Kansas, where he was widely known to be the Koch brothers' favorite lawmaker. He once wrote an article for Politico titled, Stop Harassing the Koch Brothers. Pompeo also has a long history of ties to Islamophobic organizations. The Group Act for America, which is considered the largest anti-Muslim group in America, awarded Pompeo its highest honor, the National Security Eagle Award, in 2016. The Southern Poverty Law Center considers the organization a hate group. On the foreign policy front, the National Iranian American Council has warned Pompeo's confirmation would threaten the Iran nuclear deal and increase the risk of a U.S. attack on Iran. Pompeo is also a vocal climate change denier. More than 200 environmental groups wrote a letter this week to senators urging Pompeo's rejection. We're joined now by two guests. Trita Parsi is founder and president of the National Iranian American Council, author of Losing an Enemy, Obama, Iran and the Triumph of Diplomacy. And Zed Jelani is a staff reporter at The Intercept. Zed, you've been on Capitol Hill um, uh, following what's happening in the preparations for the hearing today for Pompeo to become secretary of state. Talk about what you found. Yeah, it's actually very interesting, because uh, unlike a number of the nominees that went through last year, when the Trump administration uh, sort of initially staffed up, uh, Mike Pompeo's nomination is actually in a bit of danger. Uh, one, as you uh, played earlier, Senator Rand Paul, a leading um, sort of Republican on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, has already come out and said that he would try to block his nomination. Uh, now, recall that when Pompeo was uh, confirmed as CIA director, he received the support of 14 Senate Democrats as well as one independent, Angus King of Maine. Uh, that basically creates a calculus where, on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, they could effectively block Pompeo's nomination due to the new uh, sort of Senate dynamics. Uh, now, it is possible that they could uh, bring Pompeo directly to the floor um, and bypass the committee, but that really hasn't happened, and I think, in decades. Um, or, ultimately, if President Trump really wants to appoint him, he could always use a recess appointment. Um, but sort of forcing them to take those steps uh, would, would, would draw a lot of political capital from the Trump administration and could, you know, if the Democrats, uh, I believe uh, Senator Paul had said something about uh, Gina Haspel, who was nominated uh, for CIA director, but it also applies here, which is that he said that the, uh, if the Democrats show solidarity, they can block these nominations. And I think that a number of them, and you, you played the, uh, you know, the, sec the you actually played the, the tweet from Brian Schatz. Uh, where he said he sort of changed his mind. I think a lot of those Democrats right now, you know, it's a big question mark for them. A lot of them have not announced that they're going to continue to support Pompeo like they did last year. So I think that's really the big question in the room, is whether uh, the Senate Democratic Caucus will stick together with Rand Paul and sort of block the nomination or attempt to at least slow it down. And Schatz saying, uh, I voted yes on Pompeo for CIA on the theory he would be the adult in the room. I was wrong. I'm voting no on Pompeo for secretary of state because our top diplomat should believe in diplomacy. He has an alarming tendency towards military provocation and brinksmanship, said. Yes, well, I think, uh, you know, that tweet, you know, shows sort of a, you know, there's a learning curve, I think, among members of Congress. I think there was a logical error sort of made uh, towards President Trump at the beginning, whereas, you know, I think he was perceived as having sort of a very strong ideological bent, and they needed security state figures like generals. Um, for instance, a lot of senators, including even Bernie Sanders, voted for John Kelly to lead DHS for the same reason. But I think a, a more uh, I think what we're coming around to uh, in Washington is understanding that Trump doesn't really have a very strong ideological bent. Uh, he's more of a pragmatist, but he's very malleable when it comes to the people who are around him. So I think that in the first term uh, or the first year 
of President Trump's presidency. We've seen sort of moderate hawks around him, people who could easily have worked for Obama, most of them, uh, or for Clinton. But I think now that you're saying, you know, maybe Gina Haspel at CIA, John Bolton, and not, you know, being a national security advisor, Mike Pompeo at CIA, I think that that would be a tangible shift to the right. And I think that, it, you know, that's scaring a lot of, I think, people who are, who are willing to go along with that strategy a year ago, like Brian Schatz. Well, uh, Trita Barsi, um, could you talk about some of your concerns uh, uh, with Pompeo, uh, and in particular uh, the concerns that others have also expressed that in nominating uh, uh, Mike Pompeo, Trump is more or less putting together a war cabinet, uh, given that John Bolton has also just come in earlier this week as national security adviser? Yes, I think that is very much part of the context here that I think is also giving a lot of senators pause, which is that this is not just a vote for Pompeo. This would be to enable um, Donald Trump to have a cabinet in which you have no longer these mythical uh, adults in the room any longer, but rather an almost exclusively yes-men. And uh, as a result, I think what is emerging on Capitol Hill is a understanding that a vote for Pompeo is essentially a vote for John Bolton, and a vote for John Bolton is a vote for war. And I think that has been one of the factors that has really changed the dynamics, because it can be very difficult for the Democrats to be able to justify such a vote, particularly mindful of the fact that we are very likely to uh, see the death of the Iran nuclear deal, which then once again will open up the pathway for a war between the United States and Iran. You don't want to be a senator that has actually enabled that to happen by casting a vote for Pompeo, if you're on the Democratic side, as well as some Republicans. I mean, I think right now a lot of eyes are going to be on Senator Jeff Flake, because if Flake decides to vote against and all of the Democrats vote against, then Pompeo's nomination is dead. I'd like to turn to Pompeo, speaking to Face the Nation about Iran and North Korea. Critique of the Obama administration's JCPOA commitment was that they left the Iranians with uh, a breakout capacity. They had a short time frame that these would, uh, these restrictions would remain in place, and North Korea's human capital and enrichment capacity continues to remain in place. Those are, those are all things that uh, present risk to the world. And President Obama is, excuse me, President Trump is is determined to prevent that from happening in North Korea. Trita Parsi. Well, here again, I think you're seeing um, that Pompeo is saying something very different once he got through the CIA uh, nomination than what he said at the CIA hear uh, nomination hearings. Then he struck a much more moderate tone, being very aware of that his hawkishness would be a concern for a lot of senators. And having read his uh, the transcript of his uh, statement that he's going to give today, it's very clear that he's very worried about this once again. But his views, I think, have become quite clear now. They're undeniable. His rejection of the Iran deal is part of the reason why he's being nominated by Donald Trump to be secretary of state. And his uh, arguments in regards to the breakout capability is, is entirely wrong, because um, in the case of the Iran deal, the breakout capability has been extended to one full year, which then, combined with the very, very intrusive inspections, makes it essentially impossible for the Iranians to be able to build a nuclear bomb without getting detected very, very early, which gives the world an opportunity to intervene. That is, of course, all based on the idea that we live up to our end of the bargain of this deal and allow those inspections to continue. But if we pull out of the deal, which Trump is very likely to do, particularly with people like Bolton and Pompeo around him, then we lose the inspections. And if we lose the inspections, forget about a 12-month breakout capability. That's when the real danger comes in. So the path that Pompeo is uh, arguing for is actually the exact path that would lead us to uh, some of these disastrous consequences. And one approach that he's had to all of this that I think we should be very concerned about is that, as head of CIA, he was presented with evidence from the CIA that showed that the Iranians are living up to the deal. His response was, well, we know that they're still cheating. He had no evidence for that, but he had already drawn that conclusion. That reminds us of what happened during the Iraq war, in which the conclusion was drawn first, and then the CIA was being asked, now go find the evidence for it. Well, Trita, I want to go uh, uh, to another uh, related issue, which is his uh, Pompeo's well-documented uh, uh, Islamophobia. Now, in June 2013, two months after the Boston Marathon bombing, then-Congressman Mike Pompeo erroneously claimed Muslim groups had not condemned the attack. 
Just under two months since the attacks in Boston, and in those intervening weeks, the silence of Muslim leaders has been deafening. One of the most devastating terrorist attacks on America in the last 20 years come overwhelmingly from people of a single faith and are performed in the name of that faith. A special obligation falls on those that are the leaders of that faith. Silence has made these Islamic leaders across America potentially complicit in these acts. If a religion claims to be one of peace, Mr. Speaker, its leaders must reject violence that is perpetrated in its name. A day after Pompeo gave those remarks, the Council on American Islamic Relations wrote to him demanding an apology. CARE and a number of other uh, Muslim, major Muslim organizations had, in fact, condemned the marathon bombings, many within hours of the attack, and organized blood drives and other relief efforts in Boston. Pompeo never apologized or responded to the letter from CARE. So, Trita Parsi, can you, can you talk about that and uh, your concerns about the way in which uh, Mike Pompeo has spoken about Muslims in America? Well, I think once again we're seeing that his line of thinking is very much in line with the thinking of Donald Trump here. So rather than being someone that actually would be able to bring in a different perspective into the White House, balance things, be an adult in the room, as Brian Schatz originally thought uh, Pompeo would be, instead we're seeing someone that actually will be enabling the worst instincts of Donald Trump. Uh, and I think this will be very dangerous to have someone as the Secretary of State holding those views, because these are views that are considered and are extremist views, and uh, it's going to create additional problems for the United States if, uh, in its diplomacy with the rest of the world, is propagating views of this kind. 2015, Mike Pompeo appeared on the radio show of the longtime Islamophobe Frank Gaffney, Pompeo agreeing with Gaffney that then-President Obama had a, quote, affinity for Muslim terrorists. This clip begins with Gaffney. I wonder whether, in fact, what the president is conveying to them is not simply that he doesn't understand, but that there's really kind of an affinity for, if not the violent beheading and crucifixions and, you know, slaying of Christians and all that, but at least for the cause in which these guys are engaged in such activities. I mean, you're watching this very closely, of course, from your vantage point on the Intelligence Committee. Could that possibly be a takeaway for bad guys who hear him saying nothing about uh, their ideological agenda? Frank, every place you stare at the president's policies and statements, you see what you just described. So the Egyptians bomb terrorists in eastern Libya, and the administration says, gosh, we can't support that. The Egyptians, under their leader al-Sisi, uh, begin to push back inside the ideology of the faith, and our president refuses to talk about it that way. Today, Americans are sitting at a table with the Iranians, the largest state sponsor of terror in the world. Uh, treating them as if they're a negotiating partner. Every policy of this administration has treated America as if we are the problem and not the solution to keeping not only America safe, but a, a stable world. So that's Mike Pompeo in 2015. Zed Jelani, if you can talk about this and how this is being discussed on Capitol Hill right now. Um, again, connections to a number of anti-Islamic uh, groups, not to mention these kind of views. Well, I think this is the, exactly the kind of thing um, that we would expect uh, Congress to start interrogating uh, Pompeo on today, when he starts uh, has his first hearing uh, before the Foreign uh, Relations Committee folks. Um, you know, Pompeo not only you know has appeared and made some sort of offensive remarks here and there, um, he's actually been a booster of an organization called Act for America, uh, which is led by a, a, a woman uh, named Bridget Gabriel, um, who argues you know very strongly that, you know, the essential problem with terrorism are basically essentialized to the religion of Islam. Uh, of course, our diplomats across the world have to deal with a very large Muslim population. Um, most of our conflicts and sort of hotspots in the world right now are with Muslim-majority populations. Um, and it's very unclear whether, you know, Mike Pompeo actually knows how to speak diplomatically, uh, whether he can actually suppress uh, these sorts of views, even if he was doing this as a matter of political pandering for a domestic audience. At one point, uh, he hasn't demonstrated the ability to do the opposite, which is to be able to engage and constructively um, uh, hold dialogue with Muslim populations worldwide, which is something, honestly, that I think Rex Tillerson did effectively at times. Uh, you know, as a former uh, sort of Exxon CEO, he, he kind of had a lot of experience dealing with sort of Muslim majority head of states, uh, so on and so forth. And I think actually he, 
he did show some uh, capacity to do that diplomacy, but Mike Pompeo just hasn't demonstrated anything like that. And I think that's exactly the kind of thing you're going to see members of Congress uh, sort of buzzing him on. Uh, when he starts his hearings well, today. Let's go back to Mike Pompeo in 2014, uh, Congressman Pompeo addressing a church group in Wichita, his hometown. This threat to America is from people who deeply believe that Islam is the way and the light and the only answer. And so as we think about what U.S. policy needs to be, how we will begin to combat this, we, we need to recognize that uh, these folks believe that it is religiously driven for them to wipe Christians from the face of the earth. They may be wrong. There's some debate about that, what the Quran actually says. Uh, they may be wholly misguided, and I will tell you it is absolutely a minority within the Muslim faith. But these folks are serious, and they abhor Christians, and will continue to press against us until we make sure that we pray and stand and fight and make sure that we know that Jesus Christ as our Savior is truly the only solution for our world. So that is Mike Pompeo a few years ago speaking in Wichita's hometown as congressman. Uh, so, Zed Jelani, the Leadership Conference on Civil Rights and a coalition of more than 200 national organizations uh, wrote a letter on Monday urging senators to vote no on Pompeo. How significant is this? Well, I think it is significant in, in the— in, in the respect that uh, when, when Mike Pompeo, I think, was being uh, sort of, you know, appointed to CIA when he was very easily confirmed by the Senate, I don't think we saw the same level of pushback. You know, I think, uh, just as, you know, what Brian Schatz said in his statement, there was a belief that, uh, you know, he was sort of a longtime sort of standing uh, member of Congress with security credentials. Um, you know, he should be in there as the adult in the room. But I don't think that his views were necessarily interrogated uh, with as much rigor as they are being now. And I think that, particularly with those 14 Democratic senators and the one uh, independent in Maine, Angus King, who supported him in his CIA nomination, you know, they need to hear from their constituents, and they need to hear, particularly from organized interest groups, um, like the 200 that signed that letter, about how they're going to be held accountable um, should they vote to confirm him. Because, honestly, you know, members of Congress are very political creatures. Um, you know, they care about votes and they care about money. And if they feel like either of those two things are on the line, they're much more likely uh, to vote against the nominee. So I do think that the rising sort of activist interest this time will definitely change the calculus. And I can't predict whether all 14 uh, Senate Democrats who voted for him before, and as well as the one independent, would turn against him. But I can tell you, I can guarantee you that he's going to get less votes this time than he did last time. Trita Parsi, I know uh, you have to go uh, uh, very soon, but before you do, if you could comment very quickly on the escalating uh, uh, situation with Syria, uh, uh, what you expect to happen. I mean, Trump earlier said he's gone back on what he said earlier, saying, tweeting this morning, never said when an attack on Syria would take place, could be very soon or not so soon at all. This is a tremendously dangerous situation that we have right now, precisely because of the fact that the administration's strategy seems to only be driven by events, not by any strategic thinking, not by any type of a consideration of what lies in the U.S.'s national interest, combined with the fact that he has no diplomatic component whatsoever. Um, and particularly when you uh, put it in the context that this could actually put the United States in direct confrontation with Russia. Then we truly see the tremendous risk for escalation that exists here. Uh, and um, to have the Pompeo hearing take place in this context, I think, give a lot of these senators an opportunity to really ask questions of what is the U.S.'s natural interest in this conflict and how would you pursue it? Uh, when you listen to Donald Trump saying that he wants to bring the troops back, but then he also says that, well, you know, the Saudis want us to stay, and if they want that, then we, uh, they should be paying for it. Well, what he's signaling there is that he has no concept of what U.S. national interest is. He's willing to do things as long as some other country is paying for it, essentially prostituting the American military and turning it into a for-profit venture. That's a tremendously dangerous uh, approach to take to international relations. And Zed Jelani, uh, your latest piece, which we'll link to, with latest Syrian threats, Trump continues to be more confrontational toward Russia than Obama was. Um, if you can talk both about Trump and what Pompeo as secretary of state would mean, does it matter? I mean, already Rex Tillerson, of course, um, having gutted the State Department by something like 30 percent. 
Well, it's interesting. Honestly, if you if you go back to last year's uh, confirmation hearings for Rex Tillerson, I think the, the vast majority of questions were about Russia. I mean, they barely talked about uh, the conflict in Syria, our presence in Afghanistan, um, the conflict in Yemen, which the United States is supporting Saudi Arabia. They, they were overwhelmingly focused on Russia because there was a perception as a former sort of oil CEO that he would be too friendly towards Russia. And, of course, Democrats were angry about the hacking scandal, so on and so forth. Um, I think with Pompeo, you know, he's, he's, he has sort of evinced a, a level of antagonism and hostility towards Russia that I think Capitol Hill probably uh, takes a lot of pleasure in. But I think that the point of the piece that I wrote with Glenn is that if you actually look at the policy that the Trump administration has followed, uh, you know, its first sort of year and a half or a year in office, uh, they've actually been more antagonistic towards Russia than President Obama was. Uh, they've, they've went ahead and they approved lethal arms sales. Uh, to Ukraine. They've appointed a very anti-Russian U.N. ambassador. And now they're butting heads in Syria. And, you know, all of this has a very sort of dangerous ramifications for the world. You know, when the United States and Russia escalate, normally Russians and Americans don't suffer from it, but other people do. Uh, that means people in sort of Ukraine. That means people in Syria. Um, you know, should uh, President Trump escalate in Syria and start attacking the Syrian government, which would be illegal, by the way, without the U.N. and without Congress. But should he do that, I expect that Russia would fully just respond by bombing the rebel-held areas much harder. Um, you know, this is a, a very sort of dangerous situation. And I think the point of that article is that people should stop goading the Trump administration to be more anti-Russia. Uh, yes, it's true that President Trump may have some personal affinity uh, for Vladimir Putin. He also has personal affinity for Netanyahu, uh, for Duterte, for al-Sisi. He seems to like these authoritarian-type personalities, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the policies he's pursuing are diplomatic towards those people. They're actually fairly hostile, and that could lead to a very dangerous situation. And I think Pompeo fits in that, and I think Bolton fits in, fits in that. Uh, both of them are much more anti-Russia, I think, than the, the people that, they, that preceded them. Um, and I think that's a dangerous situation. People honestly should probably stop trying to goad uh, the Trump administration to escalate in that way, because, like I said, the people who will ultimately end up suffering for that are people in Syria our people in Ukraine and other sort of hot spots where the where U.S. and NATO are butting heads with, with Russia, is really they should be coming to terms with each other and both should be trying to de-escalate rather than escalate. Well, Zed Jelani, we want to thank you for being with us. Zed Jelani of The Intercept, Trita Parsi of the National Iranian American Council. And, of course, we will cover uh, Pompeo's hearings today on Capitol Hill. This is Democracy Now! When we come back, <clears throat> the House Speaker, Paul Ryan, is resigning, not only leaving as House Speaker, but will leave the House of Representatives. He'll leave at the end of his term. What does this mean for the Republican Party? Does he predict a blue wave? Stay with us.